I do want to express my appreciation and begin by expressing my appreciation to the faculty committee on FR&D, my colleagues in the Religious Studies Department, and my colleagues in the room and the rest of the university who make this such a, an amazing place to work. I'm grateful for the trustees and the leadership of the university who have seen fit to honor the ongoing work of learning in scholarship. And for the last several years, I have been inspired and somewhat intimidated by the work of my colleagues um, in scholarly uh, areas. And I must confess, the first thing I thought when they announced this award, last May, this award last May was, I've got to follow Laura Roselle. Yikes. I didn't even know what Prezi was before that night last, um, last year, but it was a captiva captivating way of prevent uh, present presenting ideas. And what I'm going to put before you this evening is a different form of scholarship. It's different than I've done in the past. This newest book doesn't contain any footnotes, though it is heavily referenced through tags. It's an attempt to think through perplexing concerns for the human family and respond to some of the challenges that we face and that we have in front of us as a culture and a society. And it probably would have been better if I could have put really cool images up there for you, um, but I just am not going to. I'm going to use words. It's a concept. I just wrap your head around it. Um, now, let's get one thing out in front. I am a theologian. Now let's be honest, for many of you in the room, that's sort of someone who talks to his imaginary friend, <laughs> right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And even worse than that, I'm a Christian theologian. So, someone who talks to their imaginary friend who has superpowers, <laughs> right? Um, but if you look a little bit closer at the field of theology, it is far more interested in analyzing and illuminating the fundamental claims about human life that have emerged in specific traditions and the religious symbols that those traditions employ to sort of construct the realities that we live in. Now this is tricky because there are no foundations to ground this exploration on, which means that theologians are continually struggling in their reflection for finding some kind of conceptually defined adequacy for the world in which we live. We stand at the seam of reality and interpretation, pondering who we are, where we're going, what human beings are, and this means that we recognize we are historically and socially situated creatures, and that entails a revision of all ongoing understandings and perspectives as part of our interpretive task. How do we understand, theologians ask, the correspondence between the human journey and the explicit symbols that we use to construct meaning? Now this is especially the case when we come to something as profound as the mystery of evil. Evil is elusive. It's hard to define. And the human landscape is filled with attempts to come to grips with our litany, our history of violence, and our slaughter of one another. You know, we usually recognize evil very well in the people that we don't like. It's harder to recognize evil sometimes in ourselves. And this present cultural moment that we are embedded in fixes its gaze on the individual and in this way loses sight that destructiveness and barbarism become assumed and embraced as part of our modern world. In other words, most of our culture thinks of evil as something that people do. We often don't think of it as something implanted in the orders of existence that we lovingly construct and then give ourselves to. Yet the central conceit of this book is just that. Evil has a structural dimension. And we are blind to this sometimes, and this blindness keeps us stumbling down the path of our own destruction. Now, it's always a little bit tricky to use the literary device of Satan. 
my wife told me that probably what I should do tonight is I, I and she really urged this greatly, um, that she would go out and buy a devil costume that I could wear tonight. And, and uh, my wife, Jan Rivero, and my daughter, Joy, who I'm thrilled to have with us. Um, it got disturbing how enamored she was of that idea. <laughs> And, and to make it even worse, she knows that the, the, the first copies of this book, uh, the cover of the book was messed up and they, they actually put uh, fangs on the picture, on the little icon of the devil on the cover of the book. And there are not supposed to be fangs there. She knows that I hate this. So she actually uh, volunteered to, to go find fangs for me to wear tonight as well. So Satan comes in many forms. Um, Jewish scripture has Satan appearing as the prosecuting attorney of God's people. Um, in our popular imagination, the devil appears in, in horror shows and movies and all kinds of things. The imagination of humankind has taken some very colorful directions in personifying this, but it comes down to the same thing. Why so much suffering and pain in the world and stupidity? Why does that mark the paths that we walk? So this book and now blog site, Devil's Inc. blog, were my reflections on this communal struggle. And in writing this text, I thought and reflected and spent a summer thinking about the ways that we are colonized by evil. That evil seeks to establish its domain in our personal and communal life and does so in a way that we willingly embrace it. And in this regard, I've often thought about what spirits there are that animate the world. Now spirit is a weird word for the modern ear. But I, I think of this more in the terms of the sort of John Maynard Keynes sort of understanding of animal spirits. When he talks about that in the realm of the economic order, he's speaking of the ways in which the urge to spontaneous action and human emotion influence um, what we think are entirely rational exchanges. So if we think about the animating forces that drive human existence, we have to at least confess that those forces push us into paths of destruction that is entirely self-inflicted. And if you will bear with me then, I'm going to just extract some of the text in the book to raise questions about the form that this destruction takes. Now the book was written as a blog. Um, devil has a blog. Um, the devil also was going to have Twitter and Facebook, but uh, <laughs> Sometimes the devil needed just a little bit more room than 147 characters or 160 characters. Although there was one great, in the initial version of this, one great tweet about Christopher Walken and how he freaked out the devil. Um, <laughs> yeah, Christopher Walken, what's up with that? He's so creepy, he freaks me out. Okay, so, so now we get started. I'm going to Disney World. I love Disney World. No, seriously, it's one of my most enjoyable places on that planet. It has given them so, so much. Illusions, fantasy, Britney Spears. <laughs> one small thing I've always enjoyed about it is the nuance and deception on display. Take Vegas, for instance. There, we don't have to concern ourselves with working hard. The suckers come to us for pleasure, and we give it to them, along with our requisite amount of pain. And while some of them go home happy, for most, it is an empty experience. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, baby. But Disney World? Oh, Disney World is even better, because there we can still fleece the rubes. But this time we use their most precious possession to do it, their children. Who can resist a child's plea for a little mermaid doll or a Lion King game? They will end up spending as much money at Disney as at Vegas. But this time we can use children to extort the money, not showgirls. Either way, it's true what they say, a fool and his money are soon parted. How can you not love that? Tags, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, 
anthropomorphized mice. <laughs> The original tag is Mickey Mouse, but I thought the anthropomorphized mice was better. <laughs> Desire. I know it's hard to believe when I claim this, but seriously, I am a big fan of Desire. It's truly one of the best instruments in our toolbox. I especially joy, enjoy the way with them that Desire becomes an inclination. And once it becomes an inclination, it often becomes a habit, and habits are hard to break. Desire often colonizes their souls by becoming rooted in their identities. And at that point, they are ours. They don't even give a second thought to the trajectories of their lives. Sometimes desire becomes inscribed on their bodies. Vanity, greed, lust, envy, sloth, all of these have, how shall I put this? Oh, material effects. As I said before, we want to have material consequences any way we can. Humans are full of desire, and thus they are irrational at their heart. In and of itself, this is not a bad thing because our opponent created this. Created it. But in our hands... Well, colleagues, desire can be useful. For example, in most moments, the desire of parental love is something that we find absolutely and utterly repugnant. But how often have we seen this legitimate and positive desire get distorted to the point where the child becomes an empty vessel into which parents pour their ambitions and dreams. The human landscape is littered with the wreckage that this one distortion creates. Point for us, I should think. There are other desires we are able to twist. This is why envy and resentment are much to our liking, especially when a victory can only be savored when one's most hated and feared enemies lose. You know, it's sort of like the relationship between the fans of the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. It's not enough for your team to win. The other team must lose, especially those two teams. And if they lose badly, well, that's just icing on the cake, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what happens is that the foe, the rival, the enemy comes to define them through their distorted desire. You know that story where the witch tells the peasant that she will do to his neighbor twice what she does to him? The peasant doesn't even think about it, but slyly responds, take one of my eyes. They're like that. I love that story. It's awesome. Who says a story has to be literal to be true? The twisting of desire helps us to win space, and that fulfills our desires. Tags, parents, baseball, Yankees, Red Sox, folk tales, Slavo Zizak. Memories may be beautiful and yet, you know it's coming. What's too painful to remember, we simply chose to forget. I read somewhere recently that when the question was raised, how many Serbs were killed in Croatian concentration camps during the Second World War? Serb historians came up with the figure of 700,000 victims. Curiously enough, when Croatian historians looked at the same question, they came up with the fact that only 30,000 Serbs were killed. Funny thing, memory. 
As I said above, it not only remembers what was, it also remembers what should be in the future. It is another fine testimony to our rule that memory will construct the future justifications for slaughter in order to hide present guilt. How often does memory actually recall events the way they truly were? Or is it the case that memory creates the cloak of justification for what is to come? I have spoken often of the regime of the lie and the regime of the truth. Where do you think those come from? Who establishes the truth among them? Is it those in control, the ones who control the power of memory? If this power rests with the mullahs and the clerics, they establish the truth. If it rests with the politicians, they establish the truth. If it rests with scientists, they do. For my part, we don't care who has the power to decide. We only want them to stay blind to the truth our enemy seeks to reveal to them. Truth is created by power. And memory, memory constructs far more power than human beings realize. Memory can mobilize a country to genocide. As long as they remain unaware of how this works, I foresee many possibilities for our gaining ground. Devotion to the truth can serve many masters, but we have often seen how truth for them is the club that they use to beat others into submission. Rwanda, Serbia, Croatia, Barbara Streisand, the way we were. I guess I should have apologized before I began that this wasn't going to be necessarily a, a happy occasion. Um, <laughs> further into the heart of darkness we move. Modernity, we love it. Got to think Randy Newman here. And these are excerpts that were pulled from different spaces of the book, not in a row. Earlier, I was trying to show you why we love the trajectory their lives took in the last 500 years or ever since that vulgar and drunken monk Martin Luther unleashed the zoo they call the Reformation. I've already told you that there were important moves made to create institutions that would assume control over their lives. What they do not yet suspect, indeed, what has become inconceivable to them is that an animating force emerges from all of their creations. We want them to disregard a word like spirit as a relic of the past because then they have no idea how ideas take concrete form. If they knew that a spirit of something, an animating force, became embedded within their creations, they might give it a second thought to what they were doing. But they don't even manage to think ahead. Not one little step. Hell, if they only knew what we knew, they would carefully consider every single action. In their most recent history, they made a couple of shifts that directed their lives much to our liking. Some of these we've already covered, but there is one, there's so much that we see in them that nourishes and feeds us. Remember when we said that once they stopped ordering their lives around the concerns of how others should be treated to one of how people can be most effectively managed, we rejoiced. That slight movement on their part opened up so much to us. Instead of thinking about the ends of what they should be doing, they started thinking more pragmatically about how to behave. They developed a kind of a means, ends, calculus that saw rational behavior as a way to achieve certain goals that their rationality had presented to them. The goal was defined by what was rationally accepted. Being rational meant the best way to reach this goal. Who could disagree with that? Of course, the issue of who determined what was rational was left undecided. 
But anyone with any type of foresight could have envisioned what came next. It's not that hard to figure out. Not only would those who possessed the social power decide what was acceptable, what was rational, but also the pragmatic result was a subtle but innate atheism. Discarding God from their systems would lead them to develop certain traits as absolutely crucial for the development of their world. One of these traits was the notion of technique and efficiency. By paying so much attention to making sure that the trains ran on time, to making sure that humans could be moved about efficiently, they were creating tools we could use later. They were meticulous in building systems of bureaucracy that made sure the purely human never touched anything. Well, you can guess what comes next, right? If all the trains run on time, all the ovens are working at just the right amount of efficiency, and we've figured out just the right amount of gas to use so that nothing is wasted, well, we have a perfectly rational response to the problem of the Jews, don't we? You see, the most powerful in the culture, the most educated, the most rational and technocratic became so locked into their rationality that they were unable to even think about another way of life than the one that they had created for themselves. They fashioned cages of iron that would imprison them and others in their constructions, and we didn't have to raise a finger. After they made these shifts, the new barbarism took its place, and we watched as their ambition, say, I don't know, to be the greatest architect alive, connected with those who would grant them these wishes. Adolf Hitler, meet Albert Speer. In our version of the world, Humans participate in the most heinous of crimes against humanity without a thought as to what they are truly involved in. It is just rational behavior, after all. Their lives have been shaped and formed by a spirit they cannot even begin to grasp. Rationality has come to dominate their world in such a way that it challenges even religion for supremacy. And their rationality tells them if they can do something, they must. It never really asks of them whether or not what they can do is harmful or beneficial to them. They no longer see themselves defined by anything other than the social structures they live under. That disenchantment that they so embraced has removed them from the orbit of our enemy. Our flag has been planted and it is only a matter of time before our kingdom reigns over all of their life as they must that matured historically, they developed the consciousness that believed that their lives should be defined by influences other than spirit. And as I pointed out earlier, the very suspicion of power that modernity created drove them into the arms of a self-authenticating power grounded in reason and rationality, the state. Now, post-Holocaust, we are seeing cracks in their wonderful edifice, but I think we can ride this train for a good century or so. Their autonomy has made them far more concerned about what happens in this world than the next. And while this is precisely what our enemy wants, we want to focus their attention on entirely different things. We want them to think they are setting themselves free. But freedom from what? They never stop to ask that question. And we must make sure that they never do. Tags. Shoah, Zygmunt Bauman, Albert Speer. As pure as the driven snow if it were in Beijing. I want to pick up on something I touched on earlier about religion and the individual. It is true that the individual is important to our opponent, but in a far different way than they are to us or even themselves. 
And it is true that when some of the more miserable creatures become aware or they think that God loves them and that something is at work in their lives, they can't escape our grasp, though not our influence. And this is where religion helps us. Religion itself is just another path that they take to order their world. Religion has always been a way that they take aspects of their lives and implant them in transcendent reality. Religion is the one thing that allows them to root family and nations and culture or tribe in a transcendent origin. Religion gives their lives a level of meaning that would otherwise be absent. All the religious stories that they tell one another have the effect of legitimating their particular people through something beyond their world. God, or whatever they want to call the thing, makes them special. They are the chosen. They are the saved. They are the people. Whatever. The delusion is the same among them. They often take their own particular story and make it an absolute and universal one and then measure all other stories told against their own. This is the part that we use so well because it leads to so much misery. They actually end up killing one another over whose story is best and true, or as one of them put it, whose imaginary friend is better. One of their storytellers, a Russian, caught this so well in his story of the Grand Inquisitor. He penetrated through all the absurdities of thinking that knowledge can ever be absolute, because of their desire for the absolute and universal, they kill others whose gods are different and then demand that the vanquished bow down and worship their gods. But even though this has been pointed out many times to them, they still persist in their folly. How can we not make use of that? And this is one little aspect of their religions that we can use for our purposes. There are so many more, so many ways we can distort an instinct in them that they do not fully grasp. For example, we are able to take advantage of their idea of the absolute. I find it amazing they argue for moral absolutes, only to drop those supposed absolutes when it conflicts with their desires. Of course, murder is an absolute when it comes to abortion, but when the time comes to send that child out to kill in the name of political or religious ideology, they have no problem sacrificing that life. We can multiply these examples in numerous ways, but the result is the same. Those who define what constitutes a religious or even an ethical absolute will find things not as clear when it conflicts with their desires. Evidently, the absolute for them means whatever they want it to, depending on where they are, who they are, and where they live. After all, everyone wants to see justice done to someone else, right? This gap between the professed ideal and the lived life is part of the fabric of their lives. But the rank hypocrisy that emerges among the unreflective really warms my heart. They will yell and scream about some moral violation or the other, but turn right around, commit the same act themselves, and not see the problem. For them, it's not even an issue. I sometimes think they were created more in our image than our enemies. Don't you just love the way when they are thrusting a bayonet into their enemy's body, they yell, savage. This is one of the things that annoyed me about the body. It was his willingness to relativize simply everything. Family, nation, society, even the law, they were all relative to him. All the solidarities that tied them to something, all the things that we can use to manipulate people's feelings, he wanted to demote in favor of another realm, a world most unlike ours. Who can live in a world like that? Well, I mean, he could, okay, but seriously? Just goes to point out how hard it is. And just one more comment. One more comment about the whole religion thing. I also enjoy the feeling that their attachment to purity gives them. Have we not seen this all through their miserable existence? 
The desire for purity has created the conditions for countless slaughters. We have seen them bring the quest for purity into all aspects of their lives, but it often starts in their religious communities. They claim that God loves everyone, but they are really God's favorite. <laughs> this means that all other people are actually not favored at all. You would think they'd get that. Nope. The marking of boundaries in this way all but ensures that others not of their community will have to suffer extermination. Look at their holy text. See how it works itself out. Infidels, unbelievers, the unclean, the unsaved, all of these must be put out from society because if they are allowed to live and flourish, they will contaminate the true and the pure. Totalitarianism is never far behind the scenes in this. I like that. But they cannot for their life grasp that. You would have thought that the countless millions of Jews, Christians, Muslims, gypsies, ethnicities, and others constantly served up for extermination would have taught them something. In the human's diseased mind, anyone who represents impurity should suffer extinction. Purity is an agenda for suffering and misery that takes even my breath away. It is true that they have moved this dichotomy of the pure and the impure to the political order now. But the righteous order is still of use to us when we want to pull this string. The fact that they cannot themselves connect the dots from the killing of all of those who were different in their sacred text to final solutions only means that we will be able to play this hand until that great day when they erase themselves from the face of the earth. Child's play for us, as we have seen before, all we have to do is give them the material and they will use it in ways that accomplish all of our goals of pain and suffering and death. This means more space for our desires to become manifest in their world. Tags. Dostoevsky, the brothers Karamazov, and genocide. I'm going to skip the next one uh, in the interest of time, but if I find time, I will come back and read it. If you can't stand the heat, I see that you're excited about the crafty and subtle ways we are assuming more and more influence in the world. Some of you wonder if we'll ever have another moment as sublime as the one that the Austrian painter unleashed on them. Need I remind you that our greatest achievement was hidden in the horror of what he brought to the world? How they missed this only speaks to the truths I have been trying to get you to grasp. First of all, May I take a moment of personal privilege to brag a little bit? Violence. What is it good for? Absolutely everything. Huh. <laughs> Violence is the coin of our realm, and we trade in it every day. It is one of the counterfeits we offer to the excitement that our enemy desires for them. We make it transcendent. It lifts people out of their everyday surroundings. It offers them a world infused with meaning. It takes a thing in them that they seek to control and unleashes it. Their propensity for violence wreaks havoc and destruction on an unimagined scale. Well, we imagine it. But they don't or else they wouldn't go down that road. And this is only the violence that they see. The other kind, well, I'll write about that later. That's even worse. I previously mentioned the twin towers upon which we are building our kingdom. It was obvious in their last world war what one of those towers would be. But what has remained hidden from them is what I consider our greatest accomplishment, a modern-day miracle 
of modernity if there ever was one. And I am speaking, of course, of the other event that took place during their last world war, splitting of the atom. In order to fully grasp the depth of this, you must go back with me. Go back with me to the garden. Go back with me to that wonderful story of their expulsion. Think about how clever the author was to put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the story. How often they overlook that little fact. We certainly know how insightful the author was in putting the serpent in the middle of the decisions taken. The author was wise in his understanding of the humans, their desire to know, to grasp, and then because they know, to control, causes them to blunder wildly, wielding their knowledge like a club to beat others over the head. You've got to love that. <laughs> they are so curious, and this benefits us. We like the curious as much as our enemy does. Curiosity killed the cat. Satisfaction cured it. provided we are able to shape their curiosity in the ways that we desire. Because curiosity must always end in the longing to control and dominate, or at least that is our aspiration. Anyway, the primal story tells us that they are constantly overreaching. They push the boundaries, the limitations of their lives. They are the tragic story because they always overlook what is in their own best interest. They are constantly attracted to the bright and sparkly thing outside their grasp. They were gifted with the ability to move toward love, maybe even toward perfection. They were not exiled from perfection. They're never banished from perfection. That annoys us, but there you have it. But instead of moving towards something that our enemy created for them, they turned off that path to those more to our liking. This grasping after the boundaries, the desire to take before its proper time what would be theirs if they only had patience. That is the thing that we build our entire reign upon. Oh, I know the story of the first couple and the talking snake. It's only one of the many stories that they tell about their current predicament, but damn if it isn't a true one. This is one of the reasons that we are so entertained about their fights over whether it's a literal story, as if the truth only comes in one form. We can see from this story that their innate curiosity, their desire to know, can be turned to things that are not in their best interest. And this connects to what I've been trying to explain to you earlier. Their loss of true ends in the last few centuries has blinded them to the reality that they have fashioned for themselves that spirit of curiosity moving them along the path we desire. But we had no idea they would move so quickly to the place where everything would change. When they split the atom without a thought about what hell they were unleashing upon the earth, I gasp, amazed at how much real estate we were about to acquire. There we were, there they were, together haven't eaten the tree of good, knowledge of good and evil. They grabbed hold of the tree of life and consequently death. They grasped that dark energy and from that day we have marveled. Everything, everything was in the balance. I waited with bated breath. Would they come to their senses? realize what was to come and step back from the precipice? Actually, it didn't take much encouragement because the whole quest was tainted from the beginning. But how sweet to us, how hell rejoiced and celebrated on that day. We danced and sang out our praises to them. We celebrated. We exalted in their knowledge and their foolish stupidity. At last, sweet Lucifer, at last, our deepest wish and fondest hope had come true. For on that great and glorious day, they had released upon themselves by their own hand the power to accomplish what hell could not, their own destruction, a miracle of modernity if ever there was one. And here's the thing, they rejoiced as well. 
celebrations, followed by congratulations, awards, and popping champagne corks. Those were the order of the day. And the beautiful thing, from our point of view, was the first thing they did with this knowledge. They made a bomb. They didn't really think it through, did they? They didn't struggle with the implications, or at least not that we could tell. No, they only asked the question where and when, not should or should not. Given their track record, it was only a matter of time before they fell into our hands. And what a great and glorious day that was when they unleashed that horror on the world. I can still remember the absolute and utter terror and pain that they suffered. There is nothing like the smell of burning flesh and boiling blood in the morning. It smells like victory. Or at least that was the word they used after the fireball. It was exquisite. The vaporizing and extinction of countless numbers was just as delicious for us as it was secretly for some of them. The terror and fear in their eyes, the what the hell on their lips as they unknowingly worshipped our power that day. Thousands of innocents gone in a moment and a door opened to us that had previously been closed. We stood tall on that day. It made my accusation of Job seem trivial by comparison. On that day we stood up and accused God. How could you allow them this much freedom? We deserved an answer, didn't we? We waited for an answer. We're waiting still. Yes, in that moment, I had my first real glimpse that our kingdom of desolation, our very own apocalypse, was at hand. What I have sought from the beginning of time was within our reach because they could not stop their reaching. And this is why they are so dear to us. This is why we would take them and shelter them under our wings. We understand them. We recognize them. We see ourselves in them. Can our enemy say that? Well, maybe with a few. But the numbers are on our side. Look at where the bomb led them. Nothing is the same as it was before that day, and now they are more susceptible to us than ever. Have they not lived in fear ever since? Have they not arranged the entirety of their lives around either obtaining or this dark energy or preventing others from having it? Does it not constitute the great absolute engine that drives them toward the abyss. This has been our Sistine Chapel, our Mozart Requiem, wrapped into one extraordinary package. In this moment, they created our deepest desire. And hell rejoiced. The fact that this event became absolutely internalized by them and now drives their world is truly our greatest strength. We were hopeful for quite some time that they would have finished off the job they started. And we have not succeeded yet at that fine and great goal, but we are much closer. We thought in the days after they devised their doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Don't you love that acronym? You would think they would have gotten the irony. Mad. That one gave us a lot of laughs, I, I got to tell you. In more recent times, we've been gearing up for another pass at things. You know what they say? When one door closes, another door opens, right? We have to stay positive, optimistic, and hope that they keep pushing the doors open that are closed to them. Even now, we are seeing new openings, new possibilities emerging every day. If they are anything, they are ingenious. You have to give them that. It seems like the desperate and the bitter, as well as the deranged and the delusional, are, in, are determined to one day unleash that dark power again. But truth be told, 
rational and enlightened or desperate and ignorant. We don't really care who does what to whom. We only care that death and destruction and suffering consume them. Tags, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Manhattan Project. And I have one more. I can see in your faces you're going inside. Please, God, make it stop. <laughs> sort of like my wife, the summer that I actually wrote this book. <laughs> so she tells me I was very difficult to live with. And that would be different from the rest of the time. <laughs> Necessity may be the mother of invention, but they're all still orphans. Well, sorry, I broke things off, but contemplating the recent turn of events in human life was too exciting. I lost my composure. I can continue now that I've calmed down a bit. In their decisions, they have embraced the true logic of hell. This is our great secret. You see, the splitting of the atom has made possible the means of their destruction. And for that, we are truly grateful to them. And what is even better is that this is not just a good for them. It has become for them a necessity. They believe they must have this power to defend their world. They possess the power to destroy themselves and all other life on that miserable ball of dirt, not because they choose to, but because they believe it is imperative for their survival. Now, irony may not be dead among them, but it is on suicide watch. They have embedded within their world the logic of hell and are unable to see it. All they know is that some must have this power and others must not. And this only leads them further into the morass because they don't have the power of destruction. They the ones who don't have the power of destruction believe they are at the mercy of those who do. And the ones who have not joined the club think that they must have the bomb or suffer threat or blackmail at the hands of the powerful. All we need is patience because at some point they will stumble into our happily waiting embrace, the one that suffocates them. This is not even the most sublime aspect of their blindness. This horror they unleashed with their own hands carries the potential for destruction worse than the Holocaust, and they do not recognize it. Indeed, they have so acclimated themselves to the poison in their system, they do not feel the deadening of the limbs, the numbing of the mind, and the extinction of social imagination. Few among them really question whether dropping the atom bomb was ethical, was maybe an act as morally horrific as the countless murder of millions of Jews. No one admits it was, in truth, a crime against humanity. But then no one wants to say that about war in the first place. The ones that do see what true reality looks like, we just tar with the unserious brush. They are not true, serious people, the way that the great ones among them are. They won, and that's all that matters. Any question about the morality of the act, any thought that maybe it was as little justified as the gas ovens is met by blank stares and anger. How indignant they get if the question is raised. Well, of course the answer comes. We didn't start it, but we sure as hell finished it. So, suck on that. You can see the anger when one of them suggests that all of the rationale offered doesn't measure up to the deaths of so many innocents that day. They deserved it. They started it. If we had not done it to them, they would have done it to us. Those words are sweet to our ears because it means they have learned nothing, absolutely nothing. They cannot imagine living any longer without the beast in their midst. But instead of its being a matter of something that can or cannot be, now it has to be. The compulsion of it suits us. And the ongoing justification of it entertains us. 
Because when all is said and done and they stand in our realm, all of their excuses, all of their justifications, they won't mean a thing. We don't care. We don't care why they destroyed one another, only that they did and that they continue to do so. How many crimes have been cloaked with the phrase, it was necessary? Or the one I love even more, we had no other choices. There are always other choices. Just not the ones they want to make. So you can now understand the ways that we make space for ourselves in the world. We watched as they put a face of evil to a particular type of atrocity, the extinction of millions, while the ultimate evil, the ability to destroy their entire world with its billions, numerous times over, went right past them in the name of the ultimate good. The world, rightly horrified at the Holocaust, has constructed itself around a greater evil, Potential annihilation. They truly have been exiled from the garden because having tasted from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they're unable to discern the difference between the two even though they know there's a distinction. And with this, our kingdom on earth is secure. Tags, World War II, Thomas Friedman, Iran.